Section 1 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. March 12, 1933. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking, to talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days, and why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from the state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations, and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this, in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, I shall continue to have your cooperation, as fully as I have had your sympathy and your help during the past week. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put the money into a safe deposit vault. It invests your money in many different forms of credit, in bonds, in commercial paper, in mortgages, and in many other kinds of loans. In other words, the bank puts your money to work to keep the wheels of industry and of agriculture turning round. A comparatively small part of the money that you put into the bank is kept in currency, an amount which in normal times is wholly sufficient to cover the cash needs of the average citizen. In other words, the total amount of all the currency in the country is only a comparatively small proportion of the total deposits in all the banks of the country. What, then, happened during the last few days of February and the first few days of March? Because of undermined confidence on the part of the public, there was a general rush, by a large portion of our population, to turn bank deposits into currency or gold, a rush so great that the soundest banks couldn't get enough currency to meet the demand. The reason for this was that on the spur of the moment it was, of course, impossible to sell perfectly sound assets of a bank and convert them into cash, except at panic prices far below their real value. By the afternoon of March 3rd, a week ago last Friday, scarcely a bank in the country was open to do business. Proclamations closing them, in whole or in part, had been issued by the governors in almost all of the states. It was then that I issued the proclamation providing for the national bank holiday, and this was the first step in the government's reconstruction of our financial and economic fabric. The second step, last Thursday, was the legislation, promptly and patriotically passed by the Congress, confirming my proclamation and broadening my powers so that it became possible, in view of the requirement of time, to extend the holiday and lift the ban of that holiday gradually in the days to come. This law also gave authority to develop a program of rehabilitation of our banking facilities, and I want to tell our citizens in every part of the nation that the National Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike, showed by this action a devotion to the public welfare and a realization of the emergency and the necessity for speed that it is difficult to match in all of our history. The third stage has been the series of regulations permitting the banks to continue their functions, to take care of the distribution of food and household necessities and the payment of payrolls. This bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. Remember that no sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors last week. Neither is any bank which may turn out not to be in a position for immediate opening. The new law allows the twelve Federal Reserve banks to issue additional currency on good assets, and thus banks that reopen will be able to meet every legitimate call. 
the new currency is being sent out by the bureau of engraving and printing in large volume to every part of the country it is sound currency because it is backed by actual good assets another question that you will ask is this why are all the banks not to be reopened at the same time the answer is simple and i know you will understand it your government does not intend that the history of the past few years shall be repeated we do not want and will not have another epidemic of bank failures as a result we start tomorrow monday with the opening of banks in the twelve federal reserve bank cities those banks which on first examination by the treasury have already been found to be all right that will be followed on tuesday by the resumption of all other functions by banks already found to be sound in cities where there are recognized clearing houses that means about two hundred and fifty cities of the united states in other words we are moving as fast as the mechanics of the situation will allow us on wednesday and succeeding days banks in smaller places all through the country will resume business subject of course to the government's physical ability to complete its survey it is necessary that the reopening of banks be extended over a period in order to permit the banks to make applications for the necessary loans to obtain currency needed to meet their requirements and to enable the government to make common-sense checkups please let me make it clear to you that if your bank does not open the first day you are by no means justified in believing that it will not open a bank that opens on one of the subsequent days is in exactly the same status as the bank that opens tomorrow i know that many people are worrying about state banks that are not members of the federal reserve system there is no occasion for that worry these banks can and will receive assistance from member banks and from the reconstruction finance corporation and of course they are under the immediate control of the state banking authorities these state banks are following the same course as the national banks except that they get their licenses to resume business from the state authorities and these authorities have been asked by the secretary of the treasury to permit their good banks to open up on the same schedule as the national banks so i am confident that the state banking departments will be as careful as the national government in the policy relating to the opening of banks and will follow the same broad theory it is possible that when the banks resume a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals let me make it clear to you that the banks will take care of all needs except of course the hysterical demands of hoarders and it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime in every part of our nation it needs no profit to tell you that when the people find that they can get their money that they can get it when they want it for all legitimate purposes the phantom of fear will soon be laid people will again be glad to have their money where it will be safely taken care of and where they can use it conveniently at any time i can assure you my friends that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than it is to keep it under the mattress the success of our whole national program depends of course on the cooperation of the public on its intelligent support and its use of a reliable system remember that the essential accomplishment of the new legislation is that it makes it possible for banks more readily to convert their assets into cash than was the case before more liberal provision has been made for banks to borrow on these assets at the reserve banks and more liberal provision has also been made for issuing currency on the security of these good assets this currency is not fiat currency it is issued only on adequate security and every good bank has an abundance of such security one more point before i close there will be of course some banks unable to reopen without being reorganized the new law allows the government to assist in making these reorganizations quickly and effectively and even allows the government to subscribe to at least a part of any new capital that may be required i hope you can see my friends from this essential recital of what your government is doing that there is nothing complex nothing radical in the process we had a bad banking situation some of our bankers had shown themselves either incompetent or dishonest in their handling of the people's funds 
they had used the money entrusted to them in speculations and unwise loans. This was, of course, not true of the vast majority of our banks, but it was true in enough of them to shock the people of the United States for a time into a sense of insecurity, and to put them into a frame of mind where they did not differentiate, but seemed to assume that the acts of a comparative few had tainted them all. And so it became the government's job to straighten out this situation, and to do it as quickly as possible, and that job is being performed. I do not promise you that every bank will be reopened, or that individual losses will not be suffered, but there will be no losses that possibly could be avoided, and there would have been more and greater losses had we continued to drift. I can even promise you salvation for some, at least, of the sorely pressed banks. We shall be engaged not merely in reopening sound banks, but in the creation of more sound banks through reorganization. It has been wonderful to me to catch the note of confidence from all over the country. I can never be sufficiently grateful to the people for the loyal support they have given me in their acceptance of the judgment that has dictated our course, even though all the processes may not have seemed clear to them. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system more important than currency, more important than gold, and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You, people, must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. End of section one. Recording by Maria Casper. Section two of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. May seventh, nineteen thirty three. On a Sunday night, a week after my inauguration, I used the radio to tell you about the banking crisis, and about the measures we were taking to meet it. In that way, I tried to make clear to the country various facts that might otherwise have been misunderstood, and in general to provide a means of understanding which I believe did much to restore confidence. Tonight, eight weeks later, I come for the second time to give you my report, in the same spirit and by the same means to tell you about what we have been doing and what we are planning to do. Two months ago, as you know, we were facing serious problems. The country was dying by inches. It was dying because trade and commerce had declined to dangerously low levels. Prices for basic commodities were such as to destroy the value of the assets of national institutions such as banks and savings banks and insurance companies and others. These institutions, because of their great needs, were foreclosing mortgages, they were calling loans, and they were refusing credit. Thus there was actually in process of destruction the property of millions of people who had borrowed money on that property, in terms of dollars which had an entirely different value from the level of March 1933. The situation in that crisis did not call for any complicated consideration of economic panaceas or fancy plans. We were faced by a condition, and not a theory. There were just two alternatives at that time. The first was to allow the foreclosures to continue, credit to be withheld, money to go into hiding, thus forcing liquidation and bankruptcy of banks and railroads and insurance companies, and a recapitalizing of all business and all property on a lower level. That alternative meant a continuation of what is loosely called deflation, the net result of which would have been extraordinary hardships on all property owners and all bank depositors, 
and incidentally extraordinary hardships on all persons working for wages through an increase in unemployment and a further reduction of the wage scale it is easy to see that the result of that course would have not only economic effects of a very serious nature but social results also that might bring incalculable harm even before i was inaugurated i came to the conclusion that such a policy was too much to ask the american people to bear it involved not only a further loss of homes and farms and savings and wages but also a loss of spiritual values the loss of that sense of security for the present and the future that is so necessary to the peace and contentment of the individual and of his family when you destroy those things you find it difficult to establish confidence of any sort in the future and it is clear that mere appeals coming out of washington for more confidence and the mere lending of more money to shaky institutions could not stop that downward course a prompt program applied as quickly as possible seemed to me not only justified but imperative to our national security the congress and when i say the congress i mean the members of both political parties fully understood this and gave me generous and intelligent support the members of the congress realized that the methods of normal times had to be replaced in the emergency by measures that were suited to the serious and pressing requirements of the moment there was no actual surrender of power congress still retains its constitutional authority to legislate and to appropriate and no one has the slightest desire to change the balance of these powers the function of congress is to decide what has to be done and to select the appropriate agency to carry out its will that policy it has strictly adhered to the only thing that has been happening has been to designate the president of the united states as the agency to carry out certain of the purposes of the congress this was constitutional and is constitutional and it is in keeping with the past american tradition the legislation that has been passed or is in the process of enactment can properly be considered as part of a well-grounded well-rounded plan first we are giving opportunity of employment to a quarter of a million of the unemployed especially the young men who have dependents to let them go into forestry and flood prevention work that is a big task because it means feeding and clothing and caring for nearly twice as many men as we have in the regular army itself and in creating this civilian conservation corps we are killing two birds with one stone we are clearly enhancing the value of our natural resources and at the same time we are relieving an appreciable amount of actual distress this great group of men young men have entered upon their work on a purely voluntary basis no military training is involved and we are conserving not only our natural resources but also our human resources one of the great values to this work is the fact that it is direct and requires the intervention of very little machinery secondly i have requested the congress and have secured action upon a proposal to put the great properties owned by our government at muscle shoals to work after long years of wasteful inaction and with this goes hand in hand a broad plan for the permanent improvement of the vast area included in the whole of the tennessee valley it will add to the comfort and to the happiness of hundreds of thousands of people and the incident benefits will reach the entire nation next the congress is about to pass legislation that will greatly ease the mortgage distress among the farmers and among the homeowners of the nation by providing for the easing of the burden of debt that now bears so heavily upon millions of our people the next step in seeking immediate relief is a grant of half a billion dollars to help the states and the counties and the municipalities in their duty to care for those who at this time need direct and immediate relief in addition to all this the congress also passed legislation as you know authorizing the sale of beer in such states as desire it that has already resulted in considerable re-employment and incidentally it has provided for the federal government and for the states a much-needed tax revenue now as to the future 
we are planning within a few days to ask the congress for legislation to enable the government to undertake public works thus stimulating directly and indirectly the employment of many others in well-considered projects further legislation has been taken up which goes much more fundamentally into our economic problems the farm relief bill seeks by the use of several methods alone or together to bring about an increased return to farmers for their major farm products seeking at the same time to prevent in the days to come disastrous overproduction the kind of overproduction that so often in the past has kept farm commodity prices far below a reasonable return this measure provides wide powers for emergencies and the extent of its use will depend entirely upon what the future has in store well considered and conservative measures will likewise be proposed within a few days that will attempt to give to the industrial workers of the country a more fair wage return to prevent cutthroat competition to prevent unduly long hours for labor and at the same time to encourage each industry to prevent overproduction one of our bills falls into the same class the railroad bill it seeks to provide and make certain a definite planning by the railroads themselves with the assistance of the government in order to eliminate the duplication and the waste that now results in railroad receiverships and in continuing operating deficits i feel very certain that the people of this country understand and approve the broad purposes behind these new governmental policies relating to agriculture and industry and transportation we found ourselves faced with more agricultural products than we could possibly consume ourselves and with surpluses which other nations did not have the cash to buy from us except at prices ruinously low we found our factories able to turn out more goods than we could possibly consume and at the same time we have been faced with a falling export demand we have found ourselves with more facilities to transport goods and crops than there were goods and crops to be transported all of this has been caused in large part by a complete lack of planning and a complete failure to understand the danger signals that have been flying ever since the close of the world war the people of this country have been erroneously encouraged to believe that they could keep on increasing the output of farm and of factory indefinitely and that some magician would find ways and means for that increased output to be consumed with a reasonable profit to the producer but today we have reason to believe that things are a little better than they were two months ago industry has picked up railroads are carrying more freight farm prices are better but i am not going to indulge in issuing proclamations of over-enthusiastic assurance we cannot ballyhoo ourselves back to prosperity and i am going to be honest at all times with the people of the country i do not want the people of this country to take the foolish course of letting this improvement come back on another speculative wave i do not want the people to believe that because of unjustified optimism we can resume the ruinous practice of increasing our crop output and our factory output in the hope that a kind providence will find buyers at high prices such a course may bring us immediate and false prosperity but it will be the kind of prosperity that will lead us into another tailspin it is wholly wrong to call the measures that we have taken government control of farming or government control of industry or government control of transportation it is rather a partnership a partnership between government and farming a partnership between government and industry and a partnership between government and transportation not a partnership in profits because the profits will still go to the private citizen but rather a partnership in planning and a partnership to see that the plans are carried out let me illustrate with an example take for instance the cotton goods industry it is probably true that ninety per cent of the cotton manufacturers of this country would agree tomorrow to eliminate starvation wages would agree to stop long hours of employment would agree to stop child labor would agree to prevent overproduction that would result in unsaleable surpluses but my friends what good is such an agreement of the ninety per cent 
if the other ten per cent of the cotton manufacturers pay starvation wages and require long hours and employ children in their mills and turn out burdensome surpluses that unfair ten per cent could produce goods so cheaply that the fair ninety per cent would be compelled to meet the same unfair conditions and that is where government comes in government ought to have the right and will have the right after surveying and planning for an industry to prevent with the assistance of the overwhelming majority in that industry all unfair practices and to enforce that agreement by the authority of government the so-called antitrust laws were intended to prevent the creation of monopolies and to forbid unreasonable profits to those monopolies the purpose of the antitrust laws must be continued but those laws were never intended to encourage the kind of unfair competition that results in long hours and starvation wages and overproduction and my friends the same principle that is illustrated by this example applies to farm products and to transportation and to every other field of organized private industry we are working towards a definite goal a goal that seeks to prevent the return to conditions which came very close to destroying what we alive call modern civilization the actual accomplishment of our purposes cannot be attained in a day our policies are wholly within the purposes for which our american constitutional government was established one hundred fifty years ago i know that the people of this country will understand this and that they will also understand the spirit in which we are undertaking that policy i do not deny that we may make some mistakes of procedure as we carry out this policy i have no expectation of making a hit every time i come to bat what i seek is the highest possible batting average not only for myself but for the team theodore roosevelt once said to me if i can be right seventy-five per cent of the time i shall come up to the fullest measure of my hopes much has been said of late about federal finances and inflation about the gold standard and francs and pounds and so forth i should like to make the facts very simple and to make my policy very clear in the first place government credit and government currency are really one and the same thing behind government bonds there is a promise to pay behind government currency we have in addition to the promise to pay a reserve of gold and a small reserve of silver neither of them anything like the total amount of the currency and in this connection it is worth while remembering that in the past the government has agreed to redeem nearly thirty billions of its debts and its currency in gold and private corporations and individuals in this country have agreed to redeem another sixty or seventy billions of securities and mortgages in gold the government and the private corporations and the individuals were making these agreements when they knew full well that all of the gold in the united states amounted to only between three and four billion and that all of the gold in all of the world amounted to only about eleven billion if the holders of these promises to pay were all of them to start in to demand gold the first comers would get gold for a few days or a few hours and those first comers who would get the gold would amount to about one twenty-fifth of all the holders of the securities and the currency the other twenty-four people out of twenty-five who did not happen to be at the top of the line would be politely told that there was no more gold left and so we have decided in washington to treat all twenty-five people in the same way in the interest of justice and in the exercise of the constitutional powers of this government we placed everyone on the same basis in order that the general good may be preserved nevertheless gold and to a partial extent silver also are perfectly good bases for currency and that is why i decided not to let any of the gold now in the country go out of it a series of conditions arose three weeks ago which very readily might have meant first a drain on our gold by foreign countries and secondly as a result of that drain a flight of american capital itself in the form of gold out of our country and it is not exaggerating the possibility to tell you that such an occurrence might well have taken from us the major part of our gold reserve and might well have resulted in such a further weakening of our government and private credit 
as to bring on actual panic conditions and the complete stoppage of the wheels of industry. The administration has the definite objective of raising commodity prices to such an extent that those who have borrowed money will on average be able to repay that money in the same kind of dollar which they borrowed. We do not seek to let them get such a cheap dollar that in effect they will be able to pay back a great deal less than they borrowed. In other words, we seek to correct a wrong and not to create another wrong in the opposite direction. That is why powers are being given to the administration to provide, if necessary, for an enlargement of credit in order to correct the existing wrong. These powers will be used when, as, and if they may be necessary to accomplish the purpose. Hand in hand with the domestic situation, which of course is our first concern, is the world situation. And I want to emphasize to you that the domestic situation is inevitably and deeply tied in with the conditions in all of the other nations of the world. In other words, we can get, in all probability, some measure of return to prosperity in the United States, but it will not be permanent unless we can get a return to prosperity all over the world. In the conferences that we have held and are holding with the leaders of other nations, we are seeking four great objectives. First, a general reduction of armaments, and through this the removal of the fear of invasion and of armed attack, and at the same time a reduction in armament costs, in order to help in the balancing of government budgets and in the reduction of taxation. Secondly, a cutting down of the trade barriers, in order to restart the flow of an exchange of crops and goods between nations. Third, we seek the setting up of a stabilization of currencies, in order that trade and commerce can make contracts ahead. And fourth, we seek the re-establishment of friendly relations and greater confidence between all nations. Our foreign visitors these past three weeks have responded to these purposes in a very helpful way. All of the nations have suffered alike in this great depression they have all reached the conclusion that each can best be helped by the common action of all. And it is in this spirit that our visitors have met with us and discussed our common problems. The great international conference of this summer that lies before us must succeed. The future of the world demands it, and we have each of us pledged ourselves to the best joint efforts to that end. To you, the people of this country, all of us in Washington, the members of the Congress and the members of this administration owe a profound debt of gratitude. Throughout the Depression you have been patient, you have granted us wide powers, you have encouraged us with a widespread approval of our purposes. Every ounce of strength, every resource at our command, we have devoted and we are devoting to the end of justifying your confidence. We are encouraged to believe that a wise and sensible beginning has been made. In the present spirit of mutual confidence, in the present spirit of mutual encouragement, we go forward. In conclusion, my friends, may I express to the National Broadcasting Company and to the Columbia Broadcasting System my thanks for the facilities which they have made available to me tonight. End of Section 2 Recording by Maria Casper Section 3 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. July 24, 1933. After the adjournment of the historical special session of Congress five weeks ago, I purposefully refrained from addressing you for two very good reasons. First, I think that we all wanted the opportunity of a little quiet thought to examine and assimilate in a mental picture the crowding events of the hundred days which had been devoted to the starting of the wheels of the New Deal. Secondly, I wanted a few weeks in which to set up the new administrative organization and to see the first fruits of our careful planning. 
I think it will interest you if I set forth the fundamentals of this planning for national recovery, and this, I am very certain, will make it abundantly clear to you that all of the proposals and all of the legislation since the fourth day of March have not been just a collection of haphazard schemes, but rather the orderly component parts of a connected and logical whole. Long before Inauguration Day, I became convinced that individual effort and local effort and even disjointed federal effort had failed and of necessity would fail and, therefore, that a rounded leadership by the federal government had become a necessity both of theory and of fact. Such leadership, however, had its beginning in preserving and strengthening the credit of the United States government, because without that no leadership was a possibility. For years the government had not lived within its income. The immediate task was to bring our regular expenses within our revenues. That has been done. It may seem inconsistent for a government to cut down its regular expenses and, at the same time, to borrow and to spend billions for an emergency. But it is not inconsistent because a large portion of the emergency money has been paid out in the form of sound loans which will be repaid to the Treasury over a period of years, and to cover the rest of the emergency money we have imposed taxes to pay the interest and the installments on that part of the debt. So you will see that we have kept our credit good. We have built a granite foundation in a period of confusion. That foundation of the federal credit stands there broad and sure. It is the base of the whole recovery plan. Then came the part of the problem that concerned the credit of the individual citizens themselves. You and I know of the banking crisis and of the great danger to the savings of our people. On March 6th, every national bank was closed. One month later, 90% of the deposits in the national banks had been made available to the depositors. Today, only about 5% of the deposits in national banks are still tied up. The condition relating to state banks, while not quite so good on a percentage basis, is showing a steady reduction in the total of frozen deposits, a result much better than we had expected three months ago. The problem of the credit of the individual was made more difficult because of another fact. The dollar was a different dollar from the one with which the average debt had been incurred. For this reason, large numbers of people were actually losing possession of and title to their farms and homes. All of you know the financial steps which have been taken to correct this inequality. In addition, the Home Loan Act, the Farm Loan Act, and the Bankruptcy Act were passed. It was a vital necessity to restore purchasing power by reducing the debt and interest charges upon our people. But while we were helping people to save their credit, it was at the same time absolutely essential to do something about the physical needs of hundreds of thousands who were in dire straits at that very moment. Municipal and state aid were being stretched to the limit. We appropriated half a billion dollars to supplement their efforts and, in addition, as you know, we have put 300,000 young men into practical and useful work in our forests and to prevent flood and soil erosion. The wages they earn are going in greater part to the support of the nearly one million people who constitute their families. In this same classification, we can properly place the Great Public Works program running to a total of over three billion dollars to be used for highways and ships and flood prevention and inland navigation and thousands of self-sustaining state and municipal improvements. Two points should be made clear in the allotting and administration of these projects. First, we are using the utmost care to choose labor-creating, quick-acting, useful projects, avoiding the smell of the pork barrel. And secondly, we are hoping that at least half of the money will come back to the government from projects which will pay for themselves over a period of years. Thus far, I have spoken primarily of the foundation stones, the measures that were necessary to re-establish credit and to head people in the opposite direction by preventing distress and providing as much work as possible through the governmental agencies. 
Now I come to the links which will build us a more lasting prosperity. I have said that we cannot attain that in a nation half boom and half broke. If all of our people have work and fair wages and fair profits, they can buy the products of their neighbors and business is good. But if you take away the wages and the profits of half of them, business is only half as good. It doesn't help much if the fortunate half is very prosperous. The best way is for everybody to be reasonably prosperous. For many years, the two great barriers to a normal prosperity have been low farm prices and the creeping paralysis of unemployment. These factors have cut the purchasing power of the country in half. I promised action. Congress did its part when it passed the Farm and Industrial Recovery Acts. Today, we are putting these two acts to work, and they will work if people understand their plain objectives. First, the Farm Act. It is based on the fact that the purchasing power of nearly half our population depends on adequate prices for farm products. We have been producing more of some crops than we consume or can sell in a depressed world market. The cure is not to produce so much. Without our help, the farmers cannot get together and cut production, and the Farm Bill gives them a method of bringing their production down to a reasonable level and of obtaining reasonable prices for their crops. I have clearly stated that this method is, in a sense, experimental, but so far as we have gone we have reason to believe that it will produce good results. It is obvious that if we can greatly increase the purchasing power of the tens of millions of our people who make a living from farming and the distribution of farm crops, we will greatly increase the consumption of those goods which are turned out by industry. That brings me to the final step, bringing back industry along sound lines. Last autumn, on several occasions, I expressed my faith that we can make possible by democratic self-discipline in industry general increases in wages and shortening of hours sufficient to enable industry to pay its own workers enough to let those workers buy and use the things that their labor produces. This can be done only if we permit and encourage cooperative action in industry because it is obvious that without united action a few selfish men in each competitive group will pay starvation wages and insist on long hours of work. Others in that group must either follow suit or close up shop. We have seen the result of action of that kind in the continuing descent into the economic hell of the past four years. There is a clear way to reverse that process. If all employers in each competitive group agree to pay their workers the same wages, reasonable wages, and require the same hours, reasonable hours, then higher wages and shorter hours will hurt no employer. Moreover, such action is better for the employer than unemployment and low wages because it makes more buyers for his product. That is the simple idea which is the very heart of the Industrial Recovery Act. On the basis of this simple principle of everybody doing things together, we are starting out on this nationwide attack on unemployment. It will succeed if our people understand it, in the big industries, in the little shops, in the great cities, and in the small villages. There is nothing complicated about it and there is nothing particularly new in the principle. It goes back to the basic idea of society and of the nation itself that people acting in a group can accomplish things which no individual acting alone could even hope to bring about. Here is an example. In the Cotton Textile Code and in other agreements already signed, child labor has been abolished. That makes me personally happier than any other one thing with which I have been connected since I came to Washington. In the textile industry, an industry which came to me spontaneously, and with a splendid cooperation as soon as the Recovery Act was signed, child labor was an old evil. But no employer acting alone was able to wipe it out. If one employer tried it, or if one state tried it, the costs of cooperation rose so high 
that it was impossible to compete with the employers or states which had failed to act. The moment the Recovery Act was passed, this monstrous thing which neither opinion nor law could reach through years of effort went out in a flash. As a British editorial put it, we did more under a code in one day than they in England had been able to do under the common law in eighty-five years of effort. I use this incident, my friends, not to boast of what has already been done, but to point the way for you to even greater cooperative efforts this summer and autumn. We are not going through another winter like the last. I doubt if ever any people so bravely and cheerfully endured a season half so bitter. We cannot ask America to continue to face such needless hardships. It is time for courageous action, and the recovery bill gives us the means to conquer unemployment with exactly the same weapon that we have used to strike down child labor. The proposition is simply this. If all employers will act together to shorten hours and raise wages, we can put people back to work. No employer will suffer because the relative level of competitive cost will advance by the same amount for all. But if any considerable group should lag or shirk, this great opportunity will pass us by and we will go into another desperate winter. This must not happen. We have sent out to all employers an agreement which is the result of weeks of consultation. This agreement checks against the voluntary codes of nearly all the large industries which have already been submitted. This blanket agreement carries the unanimous approval of the three boards which I have appointed to advise in this, boards representing the great leaders in labor, in industry, and in social service. The agreement has already brought a flood of approval from every state and from so wide a cross-section of the common calling of industry that I know it is fair for all. It is a plan, deliberate, reasonable, and just, intended to put into effect at once the most important of the broad principles which are being established, industry by industry, through codes. Naturally, it takes a good deal of organizing and a great many hearings and many months to get these codes perfected and signed, and we cannot wait for all of them to go through. The blanket agreements, however, which I am sending to every employer will start the wheels turning now, and not six months from now. There are, of course, men, a few of them, who might thwart this great common purpose by seeking selfish advantage. There are adequate penalties in the law, but I am now asking the cooperation that comes from opinion and from conscience. These are the only instruments we shall use in this great summer offensive against unemployment. But we shall use them to the limit, to protect the willing from the laggard, and to make the plan succeed. In war, in the gloom of night attack, soldiers wear a bright badge on their shoulders to be sure that comrades do not fire on comrades. On that principle, those who cooperate in this program must know each other at a glance. That is why we have provided a badge of honor for this purpose, a simple design with a legend. We do our part. And I ask that all those who join with me shall display that badge prominently. It is essential to our purpose. Already all the great basic industries have come forward willingly with proposed codes, and in these codes they accept the principles leading to mass reemployment. But, important as is this heartening demonstration, the richest field for results is among the small employers, those whose contributions will give new work for from one to ten people. These smaller employers are indeed a vital part of the backbone of the country, and the success of our plans lies largely in their hands. Already the telegrams and letters are pouring into the White House. Messages from employers who ask that their names be placed on this special roll of honor. They represent great corporations and companies, and partnerships, and individuals. I ask that even before the dates set in the agreements which we have sent out, the employers of the country who have not already done so, the big fellows and the little fellows, shall at once write or telegraph to me personally at the White House expressing their intention of going through with the plan. 
and it is my purpose to keep posted in the post office of every town a roll of honor of all those who join with me. I want to take this occasion to say to the 24 governors who are now in conference in San Francisco that nothing thus far has helped in strengthening this great movement than their resolutions adopted at the very outset of their meeting, giving this plan their unanimous and instant approval, and pledging to support it in their states. To the men and women whose lives have been darkened by the fact or the fear of unemployment, I am justified in saying a word of encouragement, because the codes and the agreements already approved, or about to be passed upon, prove that the plan does raise wages, and that it does put people back to work. You can look on every employer who adopts the plan as one who is doing his part, and those employers deserve well of every one who works for a living. It will be clear to you, as it is to me, that while the shirking employer may undersell his competitor, the saving he thus makes is made at the expense of his country's welfare. While we are making this great common effort, there should be no discord and dispute. This is no time to cavil or to question the standard set by this universal agreement. It is time for patience and understanding and cooperation. The workers of this country have rights under this law which cannot be taken from them, and nobody will be permitted to whittle them away. But, on the other hand, no aggression is now necessary to attain those rights. The whole country will be united to get them for you. The principle that applies to the employers applies to the workers as well, and I ask you workers to cooperate in the same spirit. When Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, died, someone asked, Will he go to heaven? And the answer was, He will if he wants to. If I am asked whether the American people will pull themselves out of this depression, I answer, they will if they want to. The essence of the plan is a universal limitation of hours of work per week for any individual by common consent, and a universal payment of wages above a minimum also by common consent. I cannot guarantee the success of this nationwide plan, but the people of this country can guarantee its success. I have no faith in cure-alls, but I believe that we can greatly influence economic forces. I have no sympathy with the professional economists who insist that things must run their course and that human agencies can have no influence on economic ills. One reason is that I happen to know that professional economists have changed their definition of economic laws every five or ten years for a very long time. But I do have faith, and retained faith, in the strength of the common purpose, and in the strength of unified action taken by the American people. That is why I am describing to you the simple purposes and the solid foundations upon which our program of recovery is built. That is why I am asking the employers of the nation to sign this common covenant with me, to sign it in the name of patriotism and humanity. That is why I am asking the workers to go along with us in a spirit of understanding and of helpfulness. End of section 3「Section 4 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt October 22, 1933 it is three months since I have talked with the people of this country about our national problems, but during this period many things have happened, and I am glad to say that the major part of them have greatly helped the well-being of the average citizen. Because, in every step which your government is taking, we are thinking in terms of the average of you, in the old words, the greatest good to the greatest number. We, as reasonable people, cannot expect to bring definite benefits to every person or to every occupation or business, or industry, or agriculture. 
In the same way, no reasonable person can expect that in this short space of time, during which new machinery had to be not only put to work, but first set up, that every locality, in every one of the forty-eight states of the country, could share equally and simultaneously in the trend to better times. The whole picture, however, the average of the whole territory from coast to coast, the average of the whole population of 120 million people, shows to any person willing to look facts and action of which you and I can be proud. In the early spring of this year, there were actually, and proportionately, more people out of work in this country than in any other nation in the world. Fair estimates showed twelve or thirteen millions unemployed last March. Among those there were, of course, several millions who could be classed as normally unemployed, people who worked occasionally when they felt like it, and others who preferred not to work at all. It seems, therefore, fair to say that there were about ten millions of our citizens who earnestly, and in many cases hungrily, were seeking work and could not get it. Of these, in the short space of a few months, I am convinced that at least four millions have been given employment, or, saying it another way, forty percent of those seeking work have found it. That does not mean, my friends, that I am satisfied, or that you are satisfied that our work is ended. We have a long way to go, but we are on the way. How are we constructing the edifice of recovery? The temple which, when completed, will no longer be a temple of money-changers or of beggars, but rather a temple dedicated to, and maintained for a greater social justice, a greater welfare for America, the habitation of a sound economic life. We are building, stone by stone, the columns which will support that habitation. Those columns are many in number, and though, for a moment, the progress of one column may disturb the progress on the pillar next to it, the work on all of them must proceed without let or hindrance. We all know that immediate relief for the unemployed was the first essential of such a structure, and that is why I speak first of the fact that 300,000 young men have been given employment and are being given employment all through this winter in the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in almost every part of the nation. So, too, we have, as you know, expended greater sums in cooperation with states and localities for work relief and home relief than ever before, sums which, during the coming winter, cannot be lessened for the very simple reason that though several million people have gone back to work, the necessities of those who have not yet obtained work is more severe than at this time last year. Then we come to the relief that is being given to those who are in danger of losing their farms or their homes. New machinery had to be set up for farm credit and for home credit in every one of the 3,100 counties of the United States, and every day that passes is saving homes and farms to hundreds of families. I have publicly asked that foreclosures on farms and chattels and on homes be delayed until every mortgager in the country shall have had full opportunity to take advantage of federal credit. I make the further request, which many of you know has already been made through the great federal credit organizations, that if there is any family in the United States about to lose its home or about to lose its chattels, that family should telegraph at once either to the Farm Credit Administration or the Home Owners Loan Corporation in Washington requesting their help. Two other great agencies are in full swing. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation continues to lend large sums to industry and finance with the definite objective of making easy the extending of credit to industry, commerce, and finance. The program of public works in three months has advanced to this point. Out of a total appropriated for public works of three billion three hundred million, one billion eight hundred million has already been allocated to federal projects of all kinds, and literally in every part of the United States, and work on these is starting forward. In addition, three hundred millions have been allocated to public works to be carried out by states municipalities, and private organizations, such as those undertaking slum clearance. The balance of the public works money, 
nearly all of it intended for state or local projects, waits only on the presentation of proper projects by the states and localities themselves. Washington has the money and is waiting for the proper projects to which to allot it. Another pillar in the making is the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. I have been amazed by the extraordinary degree of cooperation given to the government by the cotton farmers in the South, the wheat farmers of the West, the tobacco farmers of the Southeast, and I am confident that the corn hog farmers of the Middle West will come through in the same magnificent fashion. The problem we seek to solve had been steadily getting worse for twenty years, but during the last six months we have made more rapid progress than any nation has ever made in a like period of time. It is true that in July farm commodity prices had been pushed up higher than they are today, but that push came in part from the pure speculation by people who could not tell you the difference between wheat and rye, by people who had never seen cotton growing, by people who did not know that hogs were fed on corn, people who have no real interest in the farmer and his problems. In spite, however, of the speculative reaction from the speculative advance, it seems to be well established that during the course of the year 1933, the farmers of the United States will receive 33% more dollars for what they have produced than they received in the year 1932. Put in another way, they will receive $400 in 1933, where they received $300 the year before. That, remember, is for the average of the country, for I have reports that some sections are not any better off than they were a year ago. This applies among the major products, especially to cattle raising and the dairy industry. We are going after those problems as fast as we can. I do not hesitate to say, in the simplest, clearest language of which I am capable, that although the prices of many products of the farm have gone up, and although many farm families are better off than they were last year, I am not satisfied either with the amount or the extent of the rise, and that it is definitely a part of our policy to increase the rise and to extend it to the products which have as yet felt no benefit. If we cannot do this one way, we will do it another. Do it, we will. Standing beside the pillar of the farm, the AAA, is the pillar of industry, the NRA. Its object is to put industry and business workers into employment and to increase their purchasing power through increased wages. It has abolished child labor. It has eliminated the sweatshop. It has ended 60 cents a week paid in some mills and 80 cents a week paid in some mines. The measure of the growth of this pillar lies in the total figures of reemployment which I have already given you, and in the fact that reemployment is continuing and not stopping. The secret of NRA is cooperation. That cooperation has been voluntarily given through the signing of the blanket codes and through the signing of specific codes which already include all of the greater industries of the nation. In the vast majority of cases, in the vast majority of localities, the NRA has been given support in unstinted measure. We know that there are chiselers. At the bottom of every case of criticism and obstruction we have found some selfish interest, some private acts to grind. Ninety percent of complaints come from misconception. For example, it has been said that NRA has failed to raise the price of wheat and corn and hogs that NRA has not loaned enough money for local public works. Of course, NRA has nothing whatsoever to do with the price of farm products, nor with public works. It has to do only with industrial organization for economic planning to wipe out unfair practices and to create reemployment. Even in the field of business and industry, NRA does not apply to the rural communities or to towns of under 2,500 population except in so far as those towns contain factories or chain stores which come under a specific code. It is also true that among the chiselers to whom I have referred, 
there are not only the big chiselers but also petty chiselers who seek to make undue profit on untrue statements let me cite to you the example of the salesman in a store in a large eastern city who tried to justify the increase in the price of a cotton shirt from one dollar and a half to two dollars and a half by saying to the customer that it was due to the cotton processing tax actually in that shirt there was about one pound of cotton and the processing tax amounted to four and a quarter cents on that pound of cotton at this point it is only fair that i should give credit to the sixty or seventy million people who live in the cities and larger towns of the nation for their understanding and their willingness to go along with the payment of even these small processing taxes though they know full well that the proportion of the processing taxes on cotton goods and on food products paid for by city dwellers goes one hundred percent towards increasing the agricultural income of the farm dwellers of the land the last pillar of which i speak is that of the money of the country in the banks of the country there are two simple facts first the federal government is about to spend one billion dollars as an immediate loan on the frozen or non-liquid assets of all banks closed since january first nineteen thirty three giving a liberal appraisal to those assets this money will be in the hands of the depositors as quickly as it is humanly possible to get it out second the government bank deposit insurance on all accounts up to two thousand five hundred dollars goes into effect on january first we are now engaged in seeing to it that on or before that date the banking capital structure will be built by the government to the point that the banks will be in sound condition when the insurance goes into effect finally i repeat what i have said on many occasions that ever since last march the definite policy of the government has been to restore commodity price levels the object has been the attainment of such a level as will enable agriculture and industry once more to give work to the unemployed it has been to make possible the payment of public and private debts more nearly at the price level at which they were incurred it has been gradually to restore a balance in the price structure so that farmers may exchange their products for the products of industry on a fairer exchange basis it has been and is also the purpose to prevent prices from rising beyond the point necessary to attain these ends the permanent welfare and security of every class of our people ultimately depends on our attainment of these purposes obviously and because hundreds of different kinds of crops and industrial occupations in the huge territory that make up this nation are involved we cannot reach the goal in only a few months we may take one year or two years or three years no one who considers the plain facts of our situation believes that commodity prices especially agricultural prices are high enough yet some people are putting the cart before the horse they want a permanent revaluation of the dollar first it is the government's policy to restore the price level first i would not know and no one else could tell just what the permanent valuation of the dollar will be to guess at a permanent gold valuation now would certainly require later changes caused by later facts when we have restored the price level we shall seek to establish and maintain a dollar which will not change its purchasing and debt paying power during the succeeding generation i said that in my message to the american delegation in london last july and i say it now once more because of conditions in this country and because of events beyond our control in other parts of the world it becomes increasingly important to develop and apply the further measures which may be necessary from time to time to control the gold value of our own dollar at home our dollar is now altogether too greatly influenced by the accidents of international trade by the internal policies of other nations and by political disturbance in other continents therefore the united states must take firmly in its own hands the control of the gold value of our dollar this is necessary in order to prevent dollar disturbances from swinging us away from our ultimate goal namely the continued recovery of our commodity prices as a further effective means to this end i am going to establish a government market for gold in the united states therefore under the clearly defined authority of existing law 
I am authorizing the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to buy gold newly mined in the United States at prices to be determined from time to time after consultation with the Secretary of the Treasury and the President. Whenever necessary to the end in view, we shall also buy or sell gold in the world market. My aim in taking this step is to establish and maintain continuous control. This is a policy and not an expedient. It is not to be used merely to offset a temporary fall in prices. We are thus continuing to move towards a managed currency. You will recall the dire predictions made last spring by those who did not agree with our common policies of raising prices by direct means. What actually happened stood out in sharp contrast with those predictions. Government credit is high. Prices have risen in part. Doubtless, profits of evil still exist in our midst. But government credit will be maintained, and a sound currency will accompany a rise in American commodity price level. I have told you tonight the story of our steady but sure work in building our common recovery. In my promise to you, both before and after March 4th, I made two things plain. First, that I pledged no miracles, and second, that I would do my best. I thank you for your patience and your faith. Our troubles will not be over tomorrow, but we are on our way, and we are headed in the right direction. End section 4、section、five of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Section 5. June 28, 1934. It has been several months since I have talked with you concerning the problems of government. Since January, those of us in whom you have vested responsibility have been engaged in the fulfillment of plans and policies which had been widely discussed in previous months. It seemed to us our duty not only to make the right path clear, but also to tread that path. As we review the achievements of this session of the seventy third Congress, It is made increasingly clear that its task was essentially that of completing and fortifying the work it had begun in March 1933. That was no easy task, but the Congress was equal to it. It has been well said that while there were a few exceptions, this Congress displayed a greater freedom from mere partisanship than any other peacetime Congress since the administration of President Washington himself. The session was distinguished by the extent and variety of legislation enacted, and by the intelligence and good will of debate upon these measures. I mention only a few of the major enactments. It provided for the readjustment of the debt burden through the Corporate and Municipal Bankruptcy Acts and the Farm Relief Act. It lent a hand to industry by encouraging loans to solvent industries. Unable to secure adequate help from banking institutions. It strengthened the integrity of finance through the regulation of securities exchanges. It provided a rational method of increasing our volume of foreign trade through reciprocal trading agreements. It strengthened our naval forces to conform with the intentions and permission of existing treaty rights. It made further advances toward peace and industry through the Labor Adjustment Act. It supplemented our agricultural policy through measures widely demanded by farmers themselves and intended to avert price destroying surpluses. It strengthened the hand of the federal government in its attempts to suppress gangster crime. It took definite steps toward a national housing program through an act which I signed today designed to encourage private capital in the rebuilding of the homes of the nation. It created a permanent federal body for the just regulation of all forms of communication, including the telephone, the telegraph, and the radio. Finally, and I believe most important, it reorganized, simplified, and made more fair and just our monetary system, setting up standards and policies adequate to meet the necessities of modern economic life, doing justice to both gold and silver as the metal bases. Behind the currency of the United States. 
in the consistent development of our previous efforts toward the saving and safeguarding of our national life i have continued to recognize three related steps the first was relief because the primary concern of any government dominated by the humane ideals of democracy is the simple principle that in a land of vast resources no one should be permitted to starve relief was and continues to be our first consideration it calls for large expenditures and will continue in modified form to do so for a long time to come we may as well recognize that fact it comes from the paralysis that arose as the after-effect of that unfortunate decade characterized by a mad chase for unearned riches and an unwillingness of leaders in almost every walk of life to look beyond their own schemes and speculations in our administration of relief we follow two principles first that direct giving shall wherever possible be supplemented by provision for useful and remunerative work and second that where families in their existing surroundings will in all human probability never find an opportunity for full self-maintenance happiness and enjoyment we will try to give them a new chance in new surroundings the second step was recovery and it is sufficient for me to ask each and every one of you to compare the situation in agriculture and in industry today with what it was fifteen months ago at the same time we have recognized the necessity of reform and reconstruction reform because much of our trouble today and in the past few years has been due to a lack of understanding of the elementary principles of justice and fairness by those in whom leadership in business and finance was placed reconstruction because new conditions in our economic life as well as old but neglected conditions had to be corrected substantial gains well known to all of you have justified our course i could cite statistics to you as unanswerable measures of our national progress statistics to show the gain in the average weekly pay envelope of workers in the great majority of industries statistics to show hundreds of thousands re-employed in private industries and other hundreds of thousands given new employment through the expansion of direct and indirect government assistance of many kinds although of course there are those exceptions in professional pursuits whose economic improvement of necessity will be delayed i also could cite statistics to show the great rise in the value of farm products statistics to prove the demand for consumers goods ranging all the way from food and clothing to automobiles and of late to prove the rise in the demand for durable goods statistics to cover the great increase in bank deposits and to show the scores of thousands of homes and of farms which have been saved from foreclosure but the simplest way for each of you to judge recovery lies in the plain facts of your own individual situation are you better off than you were last year? Are your debts less burdensome? Is your bank account more secure? Are your working conditions better? Is your faith in your own individual future more firmly grounded? Also, let me put to you another simple question. Have you as an individual paid too high a price for these gains? Plausible self-seekers and theoretical diehards will tell you of the loss of individual liberty answer this question also out of the facts of your own life have you lost any of your rights or liberty or constitutional freedom of action and choice turn to the bill of rights of the constitution which i have solemnly sworn to maintain and under which your freedom rests secure read each provision of that bill of rights and ask yourself whether you personally have suffered the impairment of a single jot of these great assurances i have no question in my mind as to what your answer will be the record is written in the experiences of your own personal lives in other words it is not the overwhelming majority of the farmers or manufacturers or workers who deny the substantial gains of the past year the most vociferous of the doubting thomases may be divided roughly into two groups first those who seek special political privilege and second those who seek special financial privilege about a year ago, I used as an illustration the 90% of the cotton manufacturers of the United States 
who wanted to do the right thing by their employees and by the public but were prevented from doing so by the ten per cent who undercut them by unfair practices and un-american standards it is well for us to remember that humanity is a long way from being perfect and that a selfish minority in every walk of life farming business finance and even government service itself will always continue to think of themselves first and their fellow beings second in the working out of a great national program which seeks the primary good of the greater number it is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on but these toes belong to the comparative few who seek to retain or to gain position or riches or both by some short cut which is harmful to the greater good in the execution of the powers conferred on it by congress the administration needs and will tirelessly seek the best ability that the country affords public service offers better rewards in the opportunity for service than ever before in our history not great salaries but enough to live on in the building of this service there are coming to us men and women with ability and courage from every part of the union the days of the seeking of mere party advantage through the misuse of public power are drawing to a close we are increasingly demanding and getting devotion to the public service on the part of every member of the administration high and low the program of the past year is definitely in operation and that operation month by month is being made to fit into the web of old and new conditions this process of evolution is well illustrated by the constant changes in detailed organization and method going on in the national recovery administration with every passing month we are making strides in the orderly handling of relationship between employees and employers conditions differ of course in almost every part of the country and in almost every industry temporary methods of adjustment are being replaced by more permanent machinery and i am glad to say by a growing recognition on the part of employers and employees of the desirability of maintaining fair relationships all around so also while almost everybody has recognized the tremendous strides in the elimination of child labor in the payment of not less than fair minimum wages and in the shortening of hours we are still feeling our way in solving problems which relate to self-government in industry especially where such self-government tends to eliminate the fair operation of competition in this same process of evolution we are keeping before us the objectives of protecting on the one hand industry against chiselers within its own ranks and on the other hand the consumer through the maintenance of reasonable competition for the prevention of the unfair skyrocketing of retail prices but in addition to this our immediate task we must still look to the larger future i have pointed out to the congress that we are seeking to find the way once more to well-known long-established but to some degree forgotten ideals and values we seek the security of the men women and children of the nation that security involves added means of providing better homes for the people of the nation that is the first principle of our future program the second is to plan the use of land and water resources of this country to the end that the means of livelihood of our citizens may be more adequate to meet their daily needs and finally the third principle is to use the agencies of government to assist in the establishment of means to provide sound and adequate protection against the vicissitudes of modern life in other words social insurance later in the year i hope to talk with you more fully about these plans a few timid people who fear progress will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing sometimes they will call it fascism sometimes communism sometimes regimentation sometimes socialism but in so doing they are trying to make very complex and theoretical something that is really very simple and very practical i believe in practical explanations and in practical policies i believe that what we are doing today is a necessary fulfillment of what americans have always been doing a fulfillment of old and tested american ideals 
Let me give you a simple illustration. While I am away from Washington this summer, a long-needed renovation of and addition to our White House office building is to be started. The architects have planned a few new rooms built into the present all-too-small one-story structure. We are going to include in this addition and in this renovation modern electric wiring and modern plumbing and modern means of keeping the offices cool in the hot Washington summers. But the structural lines of the old executive office building will remain. The artistic lines of the White House buildings were the creation of master builders when our republic was young. The simplicity and the strength of the structure remain in the face of every modern test. But within this magnificent pattern, the necessities of modern government business require constant reorganization and rebuilding. If I were to listen to the arguments of some prophets of calamity who are talking these days, I should hesitate to make these alterations. I should fear that while I am away for a few weeks the architects might build some strange new Gothic tower, or a factory building, or perhaps a replica of the Kremlin or of the Potsdam Palace. But I have no such fears. The architects and builders are men of common sense and of artistic American tastes. They know that the principles of harmony and necessity itself require that the building of the new structure shall blend with the essential lines of the old. It is this combination of the old and the new that marks orderly, peaceful progress, not only in building buildings, but in building government itself. Our new structure is a part of and a fulfillment of the old. All that we do seeks to fulfill the historic traditions of the American people. Other nations may sacrifice democracy for the transitory stimulation of old and discredited autocracies. We are restoring confidence and well-being under the rule of the people themselves. We remain, as John Marshall said a century ago, emphatically and truly a government of the people. Our government, in form and in substance, emanates from them. Its powers are granted by them and are to be exercised directly on them and for their benefits. Before I close, I want to tell you of the interest and pleasure with which I look forward to the trip on which I hope to start in a few days. It is a good thing for everyone who can possibly do so to get away at least once a year for a change of scene. I do not want to get into the position of not being able to see the forest because of the thickness of the trees. I hope to visit our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico, in the Virgin Islands, in the Canal Zone, and in Hawaii. And incidentally, it will give me an opportunity to exchange a friendly word of greeting to the presidents of our sister republics, Haiti, Colombia, and Panama. After four weeks on board ship, I plan to land at a port in our Pacific Northwest. And then will come the best part of the whole trip, for I am hoping to inspect a number of our new great national projects on the Columbia, Missouri, and Mississippi rivers, to see some of our national parks, and incidentally, to learn much of actual conditions during the trip across the continent back to Washington. While I was in France during the war, our boys used to call the United States God's country. Let us make it and keep it God's country. End of section 5。section 6 of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox dot org。the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt。by franklin d roosevelt section six september thirty nineteen thirty four three months have passed since i talked with you shortly after the adjournment of the congress tonight i continue that report though because of the shortness of time i must defer a number of subjects to a later date recently the most notable public questions that have concerned us all have had to do with industry and labor and with respect to these 
certain developments have taken place which I consider of importance. I am happy to report that after years of uncertainty, culminating in the collapse of the spring of 1933, we are bringing order out of the old chaos with a greater certainty of the employment of labor at a reasonable wage and of more business at a fair profit. These governmental and industrial developments hold promise of new achievements for the nation. Men may differ as to the particular form of governmental activity with respect to industry and business, but nearly all are agreed that private enterprise in times such as these cannot be left without assistance and without reasonable safeguards, lest it destroy not only itself, but also our processes of civilization. The underlying necessity for such activity is indeed as strong now as it was years ago, when Elihu Root said the following very significant words. Instead of the give and take of free individual contract, the tremendous power of organization has combined great aggregations of capital in enormous industrial establishments, working through vast agencies of commerce, and employing great masses of men in movements of production and transportation and trade so great in the mass that each individual concerned in them is quite helpless by himself. The relations between the employer and the employed, between the owners of aggregated capital and the units of organized labor, between the small producer, the small trader, the consumer, and the great transporting and manufacturing and distributing agencies, all present new questions for the solution of which the old reliance upon the free action of individual wills appears quite inadequate. And in many directions, the intervention of that organized control, which we call government, seems necessary to produce the same result of justice and right conduct which obtained through the attrition of individuals before the new conditions arose. It was in this spirit thus described by Secretary Root that we approached our task of reviving private enterprise in March 1933. Our first problem was, of course, the banking situation because, as you know, the banks had collapsed. Some banks could not be saved, but the great majority of them, either through their own resources or with government aid, have been restored to complete public confidence. This has given safety to millions of depositors in these banks. Closely following this great constructive effort, we have, through various federal agencies, saved debtors and creditors alike in many other fields of enterprise, such as loans on farm mortgages and home mortgages, loans to the railroads and insurance companies, and, finally, help for homeowners and industry itself. In all of these efforts, the government has come to the assistance of business, and with the full expectation that the money used to assist these enterprises will eventually be repaid. I believe it will be. The second step we have taken in the restoration of normal business enterprise has been to clean up thoroughly unwholesome conditions in the field of investment. In this, we have had assistance from many bankers and businessmen, most of whom recognize the past evils in the banking system, in the sale of securities, in the deliberate encouragement of stock gambling, in the sale of unsound mortgages, and in many other ways in which the public lost billions of dollars. They saw that without changes in the policies and methods of investment, there could be no recovery of public confidence in the security of savings. The country now enjoys the safety of bank savings under the new banking laws. 
the careful checking of new securities under the Securities Act, and the curtailment of rank stock speculation through the Securities Exchange Act. I sincerely hope that as a result, people will be discouraged in unhappy efforts to get rich quick by speculating in securities. The average person almost always loses. Only a very small minority of the people of this country believe in gambling as a substitute for the old philosophy of Benjamin Franklin that the way to wealth is through work. In meeting the problems of industrial recovery, the chief agency of the government has been the National Recovery Administration. Under its guidance, trades and industries covering over 90% of all industrial employees have adopted codes of fair competition, which have been approved by the President. Under these codes, in the industries covered, child labor has been eliminated. The workday and the work week have been shortened. Minimum wages have been established and other wages adjusted toward a rising standard of living. The emergency purpose of the NRA was to put men to work, and since its creation more than four million persons have been re-employed, in great part through the cooperation of American business brought about under the codes. Benefits of the Industrial Recovery Program have come not only to labor in the form of new jobs, in relief from overwork and in relief from underpay, but also to the owners and managers of industry because, together with a great increase in the payrolls, there has come a substantial rise in the total of industrial profits, a rise from a deficit figure in the first quarter of 1933 to a level of sustained profits within one year from the inauguration of NRA. Now, it should not be expected that even employed labor and capital would be completely satisfied with present conditions. Employed workers have not by any means all enjoyed a return to the earnings of prosperous times, although millions of hitherto underprivileged workers are today far better paid than ever before. Also, billions of dollars of invested capital have today a greater security of present and future earning power than before. This is because of the establishment of fair, competitive standards and because of relief from unfair competition in wage cutting, which depresses markets and destroys purchasing power. But it is an undeniable fact that the restoration of other billions of sound investments to a reasonable earning power could not be brought about in one year. There is no magic formula, no economic panacea, which could simply revive overnight the heavy industries and the trades dependent upon them. Nevertheless, the gains of trade and industry as a whole have been substantial. In these gains and in the policies of the administration, there are assurances that hearten all forward-looking men and women with the confidence that we are definitely rebuilding our political and economic system on the lines laid down by the New Deal. Lines which, as I have so often made clear, are in complete accord with the underlying principles of orderly, popular government which Americans have demanded since the white man first came to these shores. We count, in the future as in the past, on the driving power of individual initiative and the incentive of fair private profit, strengthened with the acceptance of those obligations to the public interest which rest upon us all. We have the right to expect that this driving power will be given patriotically and wholeheartedly to our nation. We have passed through the formative period of code-making in the National Recovery Administration and have effected a reorganization of the NRA 
suited to the needs of the next phase which is in turn a period of preparation for legislation which will determine its permanent form in this recent reorganization we have recognized three distinct functions first the legislative or policy-making function second the administrative function of code making and revision and third the judicial function which includes enforcement consumer complaints and the settlement of disputes between employers and employees and between one employer and another we are now prepared to move into this second phase on the basis of our experience in the first phase under the able and energetic leadership of general johnson we shall watch carefully the working of this new machinery for the second phase of nra modifying it where it needs modification and finally making recommendations to the congress in order that the functions of nra which have proved their worth may be made a part of the permanent machinery of government let me call your attention to the fact that the national industrial recovery act gave businessmen the opportunity they had sought for years to improve business conditions through what has been called self-government in industry if the codes which have been written have been too complicated if they have gone too far in such matters as price fixing and limitation of production let it be remembered that so far as possible consistent with the immediate public interest of this past year and the vital necessity of improving labor conditions the representatives of trade and industry were permitted to write their ideas into the codes it is now time to review these actions as a whole to determine through deliberative means in the light of experience from the standpoint of the good of the industries themselves as well as the general public interest whether the methods and policies adopted in the emergency have been best calculated to promote industrial recovery and a permanent improvement of business and labor conditions there may be a serious question as to the wisdom of many of those devices to control production or to prevent destructive price cutting which many business organizations have insisted were necessary or whether their effect may have been to prevent that volume of production which would make possible lower prices and increased employment another question arises as to whether in fixing minimum wages on the basis of an hourly or weekly wage we have reached into the heart of the problem which is to provide such annual earnings for the lowest paid worker as will meet his minimum needs we also question the wisdom of extending code requirements suited to the great industrial centers and to large employers to the great number of small employers in the smaller communities during the last twelve months our industrial recovery has been to some extent retarded by strikes including a few of major importance i would not minimize the inevitable losses to employers and employees and to the general public through such conflicts but i would point out that the extent and severity of labor disputes during this period has been far less than in any previous comparable period when the businessmen of the country were demanding the right to organize themselves adequately to promote their legitimate interests when the farmers were demanding legislation which would give them opportunities and incentives to organize themselves for a common advance it was natural that the workers should seek and obtain a statutory declaration of their constitutional right to organize themselves for collective bargaining as embodied in section seven a of the national industrial recovery act machinery set up by the federal government has provided some new methods of adjustment both employers and employees must share the blame 
of not using them as fully as they should the employer who turns away from impartial agencies of peace who denies freedom of organization to his employees or fails to make every reasonable effort at a peaceful solution of their differences is not fully supporting the recovery effort of his government the workers who turn away from these same impartial agencies and decline to use their good offices to gain their ends are likewise not fully cooperating with their government it is time that we made a clean-cut effort to bring about that united action of management and labor which is one of the high purposes of the recovery act we have passed through more than a year of education step by step we have created all the government agencies necessary to ensure as a general rule industrial peace with justice for all those willing to use these agencies whenever their voluntary bargaining fails to produce a necessary agreement there should be at least a full and fair trial given to these means of ending industrial warfare and in such an effort we should be able to secure for employers and employees and consumers the benefits that all derive from the continuous peaceful operation of our essential enterprises accordingly i propose to confer within the coming month with small groups of those truly representative of large employers of labor and of large groups of organized labor in order to seek their cooperation in establishing what i may describe as a specific trial period of industrial peace from those willing to join in establishing this hoped-for period of peace i shall seek assurances of the making and maintenance of agreements which can be mutually relied upon under which wages hours and working conditions may be determined and any later adjustments shall be made either by agreement or in case of disagreement through the mediation or arbitration of state or federal agencies i shall not ask either employers or employees permanently to lay aside the weapons common to industrial war but i shall ask both groups to give a fair trial to peaceful methods of adjusting their conflicts of opinion and interest and to experiment for a reasonable time with measures suitable to civilize our industrial civilization closely allied to the n r a is the program of public works provided for in the same act and designed to put more men back to work both directly on the public works themselves and indirectly in the industries supplying the materials for these public works to those who say that our expenditures for public works and other means for recovery are a waste that we cannot afford i answer that no country however rich can afford the waste of its human resources demoralization caused by vast unemployment is our greatest extravagance morally it is the greatest menace to our social order some people try to tell me that we must make up our minds that for the future we shall permanently have millions of unemployed just as other countries have had them for over a decade what may be necessary for those countries is not my responsibility to determine but as for this country i stand or fall by my refusal to accept as a necessary condition of our future a permanent army of unemployed on the contrary we must make it a national principle that we will not tolerate a large army of unemployed and that we will arrange our national economy to end our present unemployment as soon as we can and then to take wise measures against its return i do not want to think that it is the destiny of any american to remain permanently on relief rolls those fortunately few in number 
who are frightened by boldness and cowed by the necessity for making decisions complain that all we have done is unnecessary and subject to great risks now that these people are coming out of their storm cellars they forget that there ever was a storm they point to england they would have you believe that england has made progress out of her depression by a do-nothing policy by letting nature take her course england has her peculiarities and we have ours but i do not believe any intelligent observer can accuse england of undue orthodoxy in the present emergency did england let nature take her course no did england hold to the gold standard when her reserves were threatened no has england gone back to the gold standard today no did england hesitate to call in ten billion dollars of her war bonds bearing five per cent interest to issue new bonds therefore bearing only three and one half per cent interest thereby saving the british treasury one hundred and fifty million dollars a year in interest alone no and let it be recorded that the british bankers helped is it not a fact that ever since the year nineteen o nine great britain in many ways has advanced further along lines of social security than the united states is it not a fact that relations between capital and labor on the basis of collective bargaining are much further advanced in great britain than in the united states it is perhaps not strange that the conservative british press has told us with pardonable irony that much of our new deal program is only an attempt to catch up with english reforms that go back ten years or more nearly all americans are sensible and calm people we do not get greatly excited nor is our peace of mind disturbed whether we be business men or workers or farmers by awesome pronouncements concerning the unconstitutionality of some of our measures of recovery and relief and reform we are not frightened by reactionary lawyers or political editors all of these cries have been heard before more than twenty years ago when theodore roosevelt and woodrow wilson were attempting to correct abuses in our national life the great chief justice white said there is great danger it seems to me to arise from the constant habit which prevails where anything is opposed or objected to of referring without rhyme or reason to the constitution as a means of preventing its accomplishment thus creating the general impression that the constitution is but a barrier to progress instead of being the broad highway through which alone true progress may be enjoyed in our efforts for recovery we have avoided on the one hand the theory that business should and must be taken over into an all-embracing government we have avoided on the other hand the equally untenable theory that it is an interference with liberty to offer reasonable help when private enterprise is in need of help the course we have followed fits the american practice of government a practice of taking action step by step of regulating only to meet concrete needs a practice of courageous recognition of change i believe with abraham lincoln that the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or cannot do so well for themselves in their separate and individual capacities i am not for a return to that definition of liberty under which for many years a free people were being gradually regimented into the service of the privileged few i prefer and i am sure you prefer that broader definition of liberty under which we are moving forward to greater freedom 
to greater security for the average man than he has ever known before in the history of America. End of section six. Recording by Linda Johnson.